In December 2015, SpaceX did something wild. They brought a Falcon 9 rocket booster back to Earth, marking a first in human space travel. Fast forward eight years, and SpaceX is still the only player pulling off this mind-blowing stunt. No one else even dares to try, so what's the scoop? How did SpaceX seemingly out of the blue zoom past companies that have been launching rockets since forever? Let's dive in and unravel this mystery. Reusable rocket. This exemplifies the space race where if there's one distinctive feature setting SpaceX apart from the rest of the aerospace industry, it's their pioneering use of reusable rockets. SpaceX has revolutionized this technology in a manner unprecedented in history. However, it's not entirely accurate to claim sole credit for this innovation. In the past, there must have been individuals considering the feasibility of retaining these massive rocket boosters instead of relegating them to the ocean floor after each launch. Even the Space Shuttle was reusable, and Blue Origin can land their rocket boosters similarly to Falcon 9. Some other leaders in the aerospace industry argue that reusable rockets aren't necessarily more economical or sustainable than traditional methods. They may dismiss rocket landing as merely a spectacle rather than a true innovation. So, what truly sets SpaceX apart? To find the answer, we need to trace back to the origins. The first rocket boosters to propel payloads into outer space were essentially adapted intercontinental ballistic missiles. For example, the Titan II, used as the launch booster for NASA's Project Gemini, initially served to deliver a 9 megaton nuclear warhead halfway across the globe. During the Apollo missions to the moon, NASA ventured into designing its first custom-made orbital rocket, the Saturn V. Despite its colossal size, with the crew capsule being the only part to return to Earth, the rest was either discarded or abandoned. While this might seem wasteful, it was deemed the most cost-effective option at the time. Building 12 disposable rockets was considered more economical than developing a single reusable one. However, NASA engineers were already envisioning a future beyond disposable rockets. Even before the first lunar landing, they were conceptualizing the Space Shuttle, a fully reusable rocket plane and booster system intended to usher in sustainable human spaceflight. Werner von Braun, renowned as the father of space travel in America, had conceived the idea of a ferry rocket as early as the 1950s. This three-stage rocket was designed for full reusability, with the boosters landing softly with parachutes and the orbiter gliding back to Earth for a runway landing. This has striking resemblance to the outcome of the Space Shuttle program, albeit with notable differences in fundamental design. While the Space Shuttle was primarily conceived as a reusable space plane, a more accurate term would be refurbishable. However, when considering the analogy of watching a commercial airplane at an airport where it lands, unloads passengers and cargo, undergoes rapid cleaning, restocking and refueling before taking off again, all within an hour or less, can confidently deem a commercial airplane as reusable. However, if this same airplane had to undergo complete disassembly, inspection, servicing and reassembly after each flight, it no longer fits the same definition of reusability such a process would not be sustainable for a commercial airline. This was the dilemma NASA faced with the Space Shuttle. While technically reusable, the extensive refurbishment required after each flight was immensely labour-intensive, totalling approximately 650,000 hours of combined labour for one shuttle and its booster engines. This process, though concurrent, would equate to 74 years if sequential. The crux of reusable rockets lies in the balance between launch frequency and technology development costs. NASA, realizing the impracticality of the Space Shuttle's refurbishment process, opted for disposable rockets, as launching 12 of them was more cost-effective than developing a single reusable system. The economic viability of a reusable rocket hinges on the number of launches required to offset development and utilization costs, a question NASA never fully explored due to the Space Shuttle's infrequent flights. Ultimately, the Space Shuttle proved to be not only the most expensive but also the most dangerous and least successful rocket in fulfilling its original design concept. Commercial rocket companies, observing the pitfalls of the Space Shuttle program, refrained from pursuing their own reusable vehicles. If NASA, with its resources, couldn't achieve success, it seemed unlikely for anyone else to do so. SpaceX approach. Then came SpaceX, who decided to tackle the challenge with a different approach. Unlike previous attempts, SpaceX aimed to succeed where others had failed. Their strategy, quite distinct from NASA's shuttle program, made a lot more logistical sense. 
From the outset of their development journey with the Falcon 1 rocket, SpaceX envisioned recovering and reusing both the first stage booster and the upper stage vehicle. Their innovative idea involved executing a propulsive return to the launch site and landing maneuver. While they abandoned the idea of recovering the second stage early on, it was a reasonable concession. The second stage of a conventional rocket is relatively simple, comprising just one engine, a few small fuel tanks and a platform for payload deployment. However, recovering the first stage booster held significant value provided it could be made fully reusable rather than just refurbishable. SpaceX opted for the most technically challenging method, propulsive landing. This approach was unprecedented compared to earlier concepts, such as Werner von Braun's rocket idea, where booster stages would fire engines during the return to Earth to slow down before landing in the ocean under parachutes. NASA had successfully recovered the Space Shuttle's twin booster engines using parachutes. So, why did SpaceX not opt for parachutes on their Falcon booster? In short, they tried, but physics posed limitations. Parachuting worked for the shuttle boosters because they were relatively small and light, being solid rocket boosters. Once their propellant was depleted, they essentially became empty metal tubes. Booster separation. The two shuttle booster separation occurred at a relatively low altitude, resulting in a velocity of approximately 4,800 km per hour. These boosters were primarily essential for the initial liftoff and navigating through the densest part of the atmosphere. Following this phase, the shuttle relied on three highly potent hydrogen-burning RS-25 engines to propel it to orbital velocity. In contrast, a single-core two-stage rocket like the Falcon 9 requires the booster to impart a significant velocity to the upper stage, allowing the final vacuum engine to continue accelerating the payload into orbit. Consequently, the Falcon booster ascends much higher and faster, reaching speeds exceeding 8,000 km per hour upon stage separation. The formula for kinetic energy, which is one-half mass times velocity squared, underscores the immense energy the Falcon 9 booster imparts upon releasing an orbital payload. This energy is too substantial for any parachute to endure. Landing. That's why Dr. Von Braun initially conceived a hybrid landing approach combining engine deceleration with parachute assistance. However, Elon Musk's philosophy diverges. With a belief in minimalism, why complicate things by adding parachutes when engines can serve the same purpose? In the case of the Falcon 9, its engines not only facilitate controlled descent, but also double as a heat shield during re-entry into the atmosphere. During a drone ship landing, the Falcon 9 booster maneuvers through the atmosphere, briefly entering space before descending. As it begins its descent, the booster performs a re-entry burn, using its engines to reduce velocity and create a protective barrier against extreme heat. This maneuver, coupled with frictional loss during descent, guides the booster to its landing on the floating platform. SpaceX's journey to perfecting this landing procedure wasn't without challenges. Through multiple upgrade cycles, they honed the Falcon 9 into its final form known as Block 5, achieving true reusability in 2018. Unlike typical rockets, which often stick to their initial design, SpaceX iterated extensively to master the art of reusability. As Elon Musk famously said, if things are not failing, you are not innovating enough. The Falcon 9 Block 5, with its advancements in reusability and reliability, marks a significant milestone in spaceflight. Its capability to be launched and landed multiple times with minimal refurbishment sets a new standard for rocket technology. With each successful mission, SpaceX continues to push the boundaries of what's possible, paving the way for future advancements in space exploration. Thanks for watching.